been here on uh, on several occasions. Uh, Mr. Ola Hanansen. He used to represent a different uh, uh, employer before. Now he's with the Norwegian Hauliers Association. That's uh, an organization for those who own the trucking companies. Uh, I'm sure you will tell them a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, today's subject is uh, about many legal and, uh, and technical aspects of international trade. Uh, among those, uh, also <laughs> the inco terms and contracts and, and things like that. So I leave the floor to you. Mm. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the delay, but uh, I hope you'll be active and uh, if you have some questions, so we d we don't have to stop at 11 or s at point. But uh, anyhow, um, I'm pleased to be here, and um, I would like to stress that what we're going to deal with today are questions that you are uh, guaranteed to be confronted with in practical life, and um, it's also important to stress that uh, um, uh, the ability to have um, to on the one hand side uh, no logistics theory be good with your spreadsheet to to manage to calculate but also to take into account uh, uh, these framework conditions and especially when uh, uh, trading internationally i spoke to one of your fellow students uh, earlier this morning and uh, for example as was mentioned uh, uh, this um, political turmoil that we have today owing to ukraine uh, things like this can turn up and they can sort of say um, then you have really this supply chain risk uh, uh, question coming up and uh, this uncertainty complexity uh, that uh, goes with international trade is also important to take into account but of course uh, having uh, said that it's also important uh, to um, minimize the risk and um, the good news is that you have uh, quite a few international rules that prevail and uh, make the the more the trade more um, foreseeable. But on the other hand side, it's important also to be aware that many of these international laws are not applicable in all corners of the world. So you should all the time ask yourself these critical questions. Uh, are there any international laws, rules that prevail? or to what extent, in what countries, are they applicable? Um, some words on myself. I, most of my life I've been working for the Norwegian uh, Trade Council, or Export Council, as uh, it was called before. Uh, the, this organization was, has been now uh, part of Innovation Norway, and I've been working with international trade rules for some, uh, well, 20 odd years. After that, I visited Keenan Nagel. You may know that as a big uh, freight forwarder, logistics service company. And then I stayed with Nostella, working with international standards and international trans trade facilitation for some years. Now I'm in the Norwegian Haulers Association. I'll tell you some words about that organization as I start. So, the, but today's agenda. First, um, I would outline some of the complexities in international logistics. Um, because, and that's its important point, folks. Historically, many of the logistics textbooks were written in the United States. And taking into account that USA is a continent in itself, and that uh, USA, uh, at least when you compare it to Norway, is m much less dependent on foreign trade. I mean, uh, we would starve uh, in Norway if we didn't have foreign trade. Uh, I don't say that the US is also important. It's for important, but um, um, you have a, f an a vast inland market, so therefore, quite a few, at least the traditional textbook, didn't deal properly with the international dimension of logistics. And uh, one important dimension that is customs clearance and also border crossing uh, in general. Uh, I'll uh, you c I could be standing here for a week uh, lecturing on that, but I'll just give you some of the headlines, things you're you have to be aware of. Then you also have international transport law and uh, transport. Of course, if the sun shines, if there are snow queues, uh, 
uh, every country is peaceful, I mean things like that, you wouldn't need international transport law. But as you all know, the, um, the um, world is not that simple. So then you have rules to solve the conflict and um, they more or less prevail in various countries. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about INCO terms, international commercial terms. And uh, I mean, if you're not confronted with these INCO terms rules, then, well, I think then you won't work with, with, in with uh, logistics, of course. You might work with warehouse management internally in a company. And I say, of course, that's an important job, but if you're working with transport, uh, you'll be confronted with INCO terms. So um, this really goes with the obligations, sellers and buyers' obligations when uh, goods are transported. Who, who, whose obligation is it? The sellers or the buyers. And the important point here is that everybody else, also uh, the haulers that I represent today, are either the prolonged arm of the seller or the buyer. This is, so to say, the first lesson when you come to INCO terms. So you have to sort out things. Okay, um, some words about uh, my employer. The Norwegian Haulers Association is the largest and most important business employer organization for freight transport in Norway. As you see, we represent uh, more than 3,000 companies. I think we'll, uh, you could add some thousand more trucks today. And we're really um, a backbone in the uh, in Norwegian economy. Because, as we said, if there is the no trucking business around, the whole uh, economy in Norway would uh, s get to a standstill very uh, quickly. Well, some we are represented nationally as well as regionally. Also, we have uh, truckers um, association holders um, holders here in uh, Molde, for example. And our main objective is to promote and de develop goods transport on the road in a sustainable way and to safeguard the industry's economic, professionals and social interest. And that's important to underline because it's often a tendency to, to say that transport is a kind of commodity or every idiot can uh, transport goods from A to B. And uh, that is actually, uh, you can meet that point of view in the considerable parts of industry. But uh, as you shall see, this is not something you take for granted. And especially today with this just-in-time requirement, and if uh, your uh, transporter is unreliable, don't have the proper network, don't have the proper technology, well, then you may get into a lot of trouble. And taking into account that there's a such uh, um, hard competition going on, uh, Price is of course important, but also being reliable, having network, having proper equipment is also matters of importance. Well, first some words on uh, why export and import formalities matters. This is a simple ideal world. The world perhaps that we will how we would like it to be. You have a seller, you have a buyer, you have a physical transport, and well, that's it, isn't it? Well, if you look at international trade, it's fairly more complex. And um, you have to, to take more care of the procedures. And uh, this Norwegian new, so to say, bad habits of shaking hands and then we agree having nothing written. You could say, well, that's, that's a contract, isn't it? But then the lawyers say, prove it. And if you can't prove it, you're stuck. And also, and uh, quite often, if those who have a contract, who uh, have established the rules, they do have the advantage, and that goes for international transport as well. Uh, you have transport documents that also are uh, important, legally speaking, because uh, they define the, um, um, the obligations of the parties. And um, but also, this is something fairly typical for uh, international transport. There might be licenses. Uh, in my time in the Norwegian Trade Council, I met companies who had excellent market plans, but there was just one snag. Either the goods were not allowed to be exported, 
I mean, you cannot go on selling military equipment, or if you have some of these uh, boats, speed boats that are uh, produced in this part of Norway, and uh, say, well, they could easily be painted green and be part of the military service. Then the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs said, uh huh, no chance, you can't export it. So then you sort of say, double at the very start. You have to have a customs declaration, if not, the customs authorities will say, hey you, that's smuggling, or you have to pay the VAT 25%. You can just imagine you're uh, in a competition, you run 100 meters and the competitors run 75 meters. Well, that could be quite a tough game. So that would be the consequence of not doing this properly. And uh, you have also trade security procedures in the wake of September 11, 2001. And you have the same goes the other way around, and there might be customs fees, taxes in addition. And if you hadn't put that into your calculation, you can end up in a situation, the more you sell, the more you lose. And then, you know, see, the way to bankruptcy is uh, pretty quick. Then also in logistics textbooks, you have some of this nice world. You trust it almost completely, you have a full control, you have open books, and I tell you, when I started in, in uh, Kuna Nile, I got quite a shock because I was very in this relationship mood. But what did I experience? The, the sellers and the buyers are good. Price, 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 no loyalty at all. Uh, and it shifted if the competitor could offer a kroner less transport cost, they would easily switch to him. Uh, so we might say that it's regrettable, but it's real life. And part of this not trusting each other is also having a link with a payment and um, transport. Uh, that's a fairly big issue, so uh, it's not time to deal with that properly. But I'll just mention to you, letter of credit uh, in international trade is very important, and also, also um, documentary collection and uh, this is sort of so and uh, we should s uh, sell that you can link that up in inco terms because if you sell goods to me but you, you really don't trust me uh, am i to pay for this good am i able to pay for this goods you should have a means of security and say hey i put this goods in a warehouse they stop there, and that might, on a, from a Western point of view, not be the proper logistic, but from a security point of view, it's maybe absolutely necessary. So you make sure that I go to the bank, paid the money, and then you say to the freight forwarder, then now we can release the goods, but not before I have paid. And uh, this is uh, why means of payments like uh, um, um, letter of credit and documentary. Um, collection are so important in uh, and also part of real the life uh, logistics. And this is really a wake up example. Um, this is a, a big Swedish uh, Norwegian or Norwegian Swedish to be a bit patriotic uh, uh, ship owner Valenius Willemsen. What did they do? They would like to, to find out every detail related to export of tractors uh, from Mannheim in Germany. Uh, and this supply chain were ending up with uh, Australian farmers buying these very tractors. They say, what is going on? What does it take to have these tractors go from Mannheim to, let's say, Canberra, Melbourne, or in the vicinity, the, the, back, the outbacks in Australia? You need it all in all 58 various documents. You had 192 activities to take place. You had 16 different actors. Now folks, we're a pretty long way from, uh, from the, um, the, the simple world which you started with, seller, buyer, transport company. And who are these actors? Well, let's go back to how, to just to give you an, an idea of uh, who we're talking about. I mean, you, you have customs officers, both ways, sellers, buyers. You may have health authorities. 
you have banks in each end, you have insurance companies, they are extremely important when it comes to transport insurance. You may have our truck control agencies, of course you have the transport companies. Uh, as you know, with the, with the freight forwarders, they mostly don't own our equipment themselves. They are called, uh, often called the uh, travel agency of the goods. And you know, when you have a travel agency, you go to Berghansen or Wingo or whatever, a Norwegian company, they don't own the airplanes, the tourist buses itself, they organize it. And this is kind of image that you can use, uh, that goes with, uh, with the freight forwarders. Uh, Kid and Nagel, when I worked there, they didn't have uh, many tracks themselves, they didn't have ships, they had a kind of on paper uh, ship owner in Hong Kong, but they didn't own a single container ship. So, and what also international transport company, international transport and logistics goes is that how can you please and to, to fulfill the requirement of all these actors and you should ha have an interplay with, uh, with each other. So also you'd had 13 different systems here, IT, meaning IT systems. And that also goes some ways in explaining why international logistics still in a way so many is so old fashioned. I mean you're, you're all the grown up with IT equipment today and you're much more worse to that than, than me. So for you that's self-evident. But still, large part of the world, you have paper documents, you have somebody sitting there writing there and stamping this donker, and you're in big shit if that's these not formalities are not in order. I spoke to a friend of mine um, recently, but and the, the, the snag is also that you have partly electronic solutions. But it's like a bit when I was in a military service, you had a slogan hurry up and wait. So you can hurry up on the electrical, on the electronic communications and then suddenly have you block there saying, hey you, I demand these uh, documents to be stamped properly. Of course you sh should try to be aware of that, but it's really part of the business in, in many ways. Mm. Okay, so when we come to the custom such such, what do you have to do? And this is also important uh, if, you, if you're going to deal with international logistics. If you're not within a customs union, you have to, to fill out export declarations. You need a, there might be, normally not export restriction, and also security requirements. Uh, that you had to fulfill, that you could identify the goods, the persons, the sellers, and the transport companies, and so forth. On the, uh, on the other side of the, uh, these border lines, you have import declarations being having to be filled out. Uh, import restrictions might come into play. <coughs> um, if, as you might know, at least in Norway, I think you find out in other countries some. Um, Former sports stars, they buy their own clothing, clothing condi uh, clothes, and they say that's uh, Bjorn Borg, you have uh, Bjorn Dali, and other famous sports people. And of course, they use their name to sell the goods, and these um, this, uh, textile products uh, are mostly made in uh, Far East today. Uh, but you say, well, in Norway we just got 5 million people, so actually what I'm going to market my products are for the European Union. Well, sounds like a nice business idea. The snag is that the traditional, at least, the European U Union used to have much, uh, they had quantitative restrictions. So you're just able to sell 5,000 of this uh, um, this equipment in uh, the whole EU or the quota is not available until 2015 so then you end up with a big uh, stock of products not being uh, able to sell. Also as I mentioned customs fee, VAT fund and uh, clearance time. Um, <coughs> and clearance time then already that is extremely important. And that is an advice I would like to, to give you, and that is advice for real life. 
If you're going to have goods passing borders in other countries, always ask the freight forwarder or whoever will do the job how is long is necessary the time for the goods passing um, for the customs clearance in that country. You may say in Norway it's actually a trifle because uh, if you have done things and before between Norway and Sweden, you have this uh, processed electronically to the customs border. They look at it and say, OK, and go on. And then that may, you may just take uh, some minutes, perhaps if it's queue on the, the Swedish uh, border and so forth. You may stay there for uh, two hours. But on the other hand, we're speaking of days. We might even speak of weeks. Um, to take our big neighbor in uh, the east, uh, Russia, if you have everything properly sorted out, you might make it in one or two days. But if there are some, some troubles, there have been a lot of examples of uh, standing there for two weeks, three weeks, and uh, even for a year. And you can just imagine if you're in a, in a solvent business, then you, well, you will have unsellable products. But what I would also like to underline, and um, this, uh, that is the, cust the difference between a customs union and a free trade area. A customs union is really like a modern fortress. I mean, you're going back to the Middle Ages, you have fortresses all over Europe. And what this, you have this wall. And in, this in the case of the customs union is wall is equally high, meaning the customs wall for that very product, it might be 10%, just to make a simple example. So if you're a so-called third country, don't have a free trade area, you have to pass this wall with a 10%, and, but inside, it's the same whether you have Germany, France, Italy, Sweden, whatever countries being within the European Union. You have also uh, other uh, customs union around the world, but uh, EU is the most uh, comprehensive and economically the biggest. On the other hand side, you have free trade areas. You have free trade is merely making trade easier in a sense that you lower the tariff barriers, and you may see even there is no there are no tariffs at all, and that mostly goes for industrial products. That has been extremely important in Norwegian foreign trade policy, making trades easier and making Norwegian industry more competitive, uh, as well as goes with other countries. In South Africa, you have free trade associations, you have in Latin America, uh, in East Asia, and uh, so forth, the ASEAN countries, for example. So, what um, does it mean that you may lower the, the the customs, but the countries are still free to set their own customs uh, rate. So just to take the EFTA area, that is, uh, at least for Norwegian, uh, an area that could be natural to take as example, y you may have the same clothes imported to Iceland, to uh, Norway, or to, um, well, there are not many countries left in this, uh, to Switzerland. So let's say that the Swiss may say that for this very garments we will have 10%. The Iceland people want to protect some of the industry, so they have 5%. Very the Norwegians are very nice and say we have no customs at all. This you cannot do within the Euro 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 customs union. That's illegal. Meaning that the Swedish customs tariff, the Danish customs tariff, the German customs tariff, tariff and so forth is the same. But we can decide this in Norway, the Iceland people, the, the government or National Assembly can and decide that and so can the, uh, the, um, the Swiss uh, authorities. So this is extremely important of you to be aware of. Uh, and um, What's the basis of this? Is the customs tariff theory? Yeah, the customs tariff is the HS system, and you will be clearly we met with this abbreviation. It's a harmonized system. 
The good news here is this harmonized system the world made by the World Customs Organization, a WCO, is applicable uh, most to it. I should go to come to that in some covering something 90 98 99 percent of the world trade but there are still some countries in in uh, america in americas in uh, africa and i think it used to be Cambodia. i'm not quite sure if uh, they are still having a system today that's uh, how the former version uh, so uh, and uh, as you can see this system is renewed uh, every uh, on regular occasions but you should be aware of one thing if somebody is coming up with a new product it's uh, the customs uh, harmonic systems tend to be more conservative so uh, but on the other hand it's all inclusive so if it's not uh, specifically defined you may you may just be put in this other group Somebody thinks that it's very smart to go with this other group, but I can tell you after having viewed quite a few uh, custom tariffs that the, the snag is that in the other groups you tend to have higher tariffs. So rather use some time to find out if you can put the products in a more specific category uh, because the likelihood for them to have a lower custom tariff then be, be easier than which you say, oh well, let's go for the other group. Um, but um, as I say, the good uh, news here is that uh, having this common system is that it makes international trade more reliable. So what you call this in Norway, in China, in the United States is basically the same uh, for the chapter, the under position and here. But you know, as is often said, the devil is this in the details. So, so far you have the international cooperation, but from the seventh digit on, the countries are free to have uh, to have na national specifications. If you can, if you see in the national codes there is just the OO continuing <coughs> like that, you can, so to say, it's more predictable. But this is an example from the Norwegian customs tariff, but in the United States you have. 10 numbers, in the EU you have 10 and 11 numbers, you have all the custom tariffs with 9 numbers, so you should be very much aware of that. Are they classified? And to give you just one practical example, mm, if you take some specific cheeses, you find may have uh, just some brackets in Norwegian custom tariffs, where if you look up any EU custom tariff, you have 3 pages. And then you really had to go uh, to ask the p people really making this che cheese going you know, in detail the ingredients is to tell is this, this and that. And uh, that can, can be quite important. I suppose most of you know the Norwegian dime chocolate. And uh, that also goes for customs tariffs and, and the sugar directives in the EU. The, the, the quantity of sugar is just to match this uh, rule so that uh, it's not, so to say, killed by uh, fees and extra taxes. So this is kind of product adjustment uh, that goes on, on before. Customs evaluation is also important. Um, uh, we come back to this incoterms rules, but actually basically here is a transport included in a customs value or, or not. Most countries in the world, if you take it by numbers, they use the CIF value, uh, meaning that if it the cost is 100, then you have transport or cost of 10, just to make it very simple, and the insurance cost, let's just add one more percent. Then the basis of calculation is not 100, it's 111. Where is the, the FOB price? You have no transport cost included. So in that case, using the same example, 100 is the basis of calculation. So you may ask, what does it matter? It does matter if you have uh, goods where the transport costs are very low. You can just imagine you're an exporter of granite in, uh, from uh, Larvik, that's, uh, uh, and uh, you have, um, you're selling to the United States, you have a competitor in, in Canada. Um, 
you know the Canadians may also have an advantage because they have a free trade area um, agreement uh, with the um, United States uh, together with Mexico so they have basically lower tariffs uh, but and you know transporting these uh, stones to the United States that will amount to sig uh, that will add a significant amount to the, the cost of the stones so um, but on the other hand side if you to United States, Canada, uh, some other British former colonies, they use the FOB value. So for in that very country it might be an advantage. You may also have customs uh, evaluation according to, to weight. That mostly goes with agricultural products or uh, bulk products. And uh, one odd uh, thing is that the Swiss uh, used to have this um, gross weight and that may go some ways, you see that have practical logistical implications because quite a few exporters to switch say that we will diminish our packages because we won't have to pay extra uh, taxes for uh, because uh, the, the packages, uh, the weight is too big. That is not perhaps a big issue for Norway having a free trade area, well, well free trade agreement with Swi Switzerland, but uh, for some other countries it might be very important. You may also have combined weights and values. You have these transaction values. Uh, you may also be aware that, um, at least Norwegian customs, I think that goes for most other countries, they have an uh, in our um, database, you have um, a um, normal value of the, the goods, a range, so to say. But if the goods, especially with new goods, or if you have a technological breakthrough, you might have the price of these goods are to also this range. And please, Norwegian custom systems, and they will <coughs> stop. Like you're uh, playing a data game, and then you whoops. That is uh, illegal value. So um, that sh you sh one should be aware of, uh, of that. <coughs> Country of origin is another matter of importance. And country of origin, you may say that is very old fashioned. And mind you, this is not a personal matter. I would say, I as a producer, I'm on the personal opinion that these countries are so Estonian, Norwegian, uh, Cameroon, whatever, that they are of the country origin of these countries. They are, but that is origin according to the customs rules and uh, a key uh, expression here is um, sufficiently processed and uh, I say that I we can see that time and time over that business people say well we heard of the 30% rules I mean this is a kind of there are some rumors on the town but y you can't base your decision on that you, you have to know exactly and uh, because if up to a certain level this goods might not be liable liable to to cu to, to customs uh, duties, but whereas if they're too foreign, so to say, uh, all of a sudden you might end up with 15, 20 percent customs, and um, that is all. It could also be a crash with outsourcing, really. You may say that, uh, well, uh, outsourcing production to Poland is much more expensive than outsourcing it to China. But if the Chinese products are met with 20% customs and you also have longer lead times, if you really made uh, your um, take these factors into account when you make your logistical calculation, you might very well up and say, well, uh, on balance, <coughs> it's worthwhile. Uh, and uh, the Chinese might be Chinese might be competitive, but uh, they're not, so to say, not part of the the club, so to say. And here's one practical example. Let's say uh, let's say that you're in the painting business, and you you would like to have quite a few ingredients from China. Uh, you say now we're back to the the HS, the custom system. Uh, these are classified. The mostly by chapter or under chapter, the four first digits, then we're still in the ISHS world, the harmonious system. And you're doing the, the painting uh, the production itself based on these Chinese ingredients. 
Uh, as I mentioned, Norway is a pretty small market, so you're, uh, you have uh, based yourself on export to the EU, whether it might be Italy, France, uh, Germany, any countries. Then you have to look up in the free trade agreement these uh, rules of origins. Are they sufficiently processed? Yes, according to these rules. So then you have no customs to Italy. But if you say, well, I could outsource the whole production to China, why do anything in Norway at all? And, uh, and uh, transporting them directly to Italy, well, might be an idea. But then you're liable to 6.5% customs. And this is important, folks. But uh, I say that in, in practical life, you have a lot of, uh, well, business-minded uh, people. That's very well starting up saying outsourcing is idea, but uh, forget about this. And that could be on some occasions ruin the whole calculation. Yes, we're um, approaching in, but then there's another. Um, I worked, as I mentioned, with trade facilitation for quite a few years. So I just, um, you should be aware of one thing. It's very uh, easy to say, well, all those damned customs officers, those bureaucrats, they're making so much hassle for industry. That's their fault that international transport is so difficult. That might be true, but according to the World Bank, two-thirds of the time used on border passing, in average, I have to add, is due either to other agencies than the customs, or due to the fact that the customs and other public agencies don't cooperate. So uh, you may say that in some uh, cases, perhaps, uh, shooting the customs is a little bit like shooting the other piano player. And, um, and um, you should be aware of this, especially if you're in, in, uh, in goods for chemical products, agriculture and products. There might be various public agencies having their agenda, their own uh, various control system. And that might be very lot of time consuming. And then again, what does it take to, to pass the border? Okay, but then you have the nice uh, development taking place in many countries. For example, in Norway, the customs authorities do their work on behalf of 22 other national agencies. Quite a lot, isn't it? So, you as a businesswoman, businessman, you just have to face one. That's very nice. So I, I can just, I don't give, a, don't give a damn what's happening behind the curtain because the customs, Norwegian customs is coordinating it. Of course, I had to satisfy their demand. Um, perhaps not if you're an agricultural business, but uh, generally I had to do that. So what's coming on behind that, these uh, various agencies have to sort out in between themselves. And this is important. i give you just one example from Malaysia. They introduce this uh, single window in our customs uh, clearance and in a short time the average customs clearance time went down from seven days to two days and of course in electronic life in the, the South Koreans have been very uh, good at this <coughs> you can go down to two hours uh, minutes perhaps also seconds if everything is on track <coughs> Then uh, some final words on what has happened. This is not a new novelty anymore, but um, you had this terrorist attack uh, and in the wake of that uh, on the Twin Tower, you had the Americans coming up with the uh, requirements uh, and also being accepted by the EU and the countries around the world for uh, security. Um, and. Uh, this is a very important today. It's like uh, it's a bit like this uh, cartoon uh, figure, Fantume, uh, that many of you may know. He's nice to the nice and uh, very hard to the to the uh, to the hard ones. And uh, uh, today, many export companies, import companies, tr transport companies, they are authorized by the customs authority, so they know you have a proper practice. You have uh, accounting practices, you have security requirements uh, for those who are working in a warehouse, in a transport companies, 
They have electronic systems that you can have a pre-warning. That's the key word, really. So, I mean, if if this good someone is a bomb inside, you should be able to track it here and not when it passes the border to the importing country. So, preferably uh, be before they did that. You had a good example of... Um, um, you had um, an air freight consignment from uh, Yemen going to Europe and uh, then to the United States and that it turned out to have some powder that is used for uh, these Xerox copy machines that uh, it well it it one, one thought it was that and it was classified according to the customs code that but it was really kind of uh, well gun powder a kind of explosives but some, uh, um, some uh, British freight forwarders, uh, they discovered it when we're on the way. And they, uh, but um, these are also really kind of frame conditions in international trade today that you have to be aware of. Some questions related to uh, customs formalities. Okay, let's have a 10 minutes break. Thank <laughs> you.